Hey everybody, um, I'm sorry I had to cancel class yesterday, but I was feeling uh, pretty sick. Um, luckily, there was only one chapter left to cover, that's chapter 24. Uh, we had already covered the abstract expressionists, and uh, what I have here is um, me recording over a PowerPoint presentation with my 6 p.m. class. Uh, so it's exactly the same information that you would get in a class because essentially you're sitting in with my 6 p.m. night class. So sit back, enjoy, and uh, as always, email me if you have any questions at all. Hey guys, this is my makeup. Uh, I am here at my night class. Say hi, night class. Hi. And this way I don't have to record everything twice. <laughs> we just got done talking about the abstract expressionists. And um, just like you guys, my six o'clock class uh, was not really buying it. So, all right, still dope. All right, so if you guys are looking at this stuff up on the screen, you're like, what a bunch of horse hockey. I think this is bull. I think this is not art. And I don't like it. Well, you're in good company because... Some people felt the same way. So here we have a piece by Robert Rauschenberg. Uh, no style for this. Um, I just want you to know the artist and the title. But I'd also like to address the uh, medium. What's the what sort of media do you see in this mixed media piece? A tire. A taxidermied goat. <laughs> Some wooden planks. That's actually the goat's hair. Uh, it's an Angora goat, and it has fur like that. Robert Rauschenberg got this thing at a uh, at a thrift store, and always wanted to use it with a painting, and he did. So do you like it? <laughs> no more loopy than the abstract expressionist. Um, basically, Robert Rauschenberg is seeing all of these artists abandon subject matter, hearing all these critics like, hooray for abstract expressionism, and he's like, I don't, I'm not buying it. So on the abstractometer, everyone else is over at a 10. This is actually a one. This isn't even a painting of a goat. It is a goat. It is a tire. It is splattered with paint. It's a really bizarre piece, but... Uh, Robert Rauschenberg doesn't take himself too seriously. I don't like that about him. He's very silly. Well, and that's something that uh, I wish this video worked because uh, he talked about that. Uh, he said that he had the panel painting, he had the goat, and he was trying to make them work, but they just never really meshed until he put the tire around it. And uh, do you remember this piece? Gift for Apollo, oh and how it was this weird, dumb work of art, but then I started pointing out, well, look at the textures, look at the colors, see how he's putting thought into it? Well, the same thing could be said about the goat. The rippling texture of the fur matches with the treads of the tires, same colors, reoccurring shapes. Yeah. Basically, I'm just pointing out that Robert Rauschenberg is a talented, skilled artist who knows how to create a composition. It's just that he's making a very odd assemblage. Hey, the wood that's going at an angle looks mm -hmm. like when it's going on Dada. Exactly, and what's Dada all about? Anti-art, Anti making fun of the art world. So if I just put a urinal on a pedestal, are you going to say it's art? And that's kind of what this is. Yeah, or hit the wall call it art. Yep, yeah. that's it. All you have to do is say it's art and people will buy it. That seems to be the way. Yeah, and actually, if you took that panel painting and uh, hung it up, you could sell it in Greenwich Village for, you know, $500,000. <laughs> well, you're also in the wrong decade. If you want to make money off of stuff like this, again, you'll also have to build a time machine to go back to the 60s. Let's see. Oh, welcome to the 60s. I wonder why. Oops. All right. What's the title of this piece by Jasper Johns? And what does it depict? Four mouths and a target. Yep, a target, and up at the top, four faces. Four One, half faces. Four, yeah, four like half faces at least. Yeah, on the abstractometer again. This is a 
one. This is literal. Uh, everyone else was trying to be abstract and expressive, and this is just kind of a meaningless, odd, weird work of art, kind of poking fun at the art world. It almost looks like something that de Kooning would paint. The texture looks like something from de Kooning. The colors look like Mark Rothko, but it has a subject. It is a subject. Uh, it does, yeah. And uh, Jasper John's paintings actually usually have hinges on them, so you can open and close them or open and close the doors. The curators are allowed to hang it however they want. Oh, like he's targeting them? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, and that's kind of the fun thing about art of the 50s and 60s is uh, the artists of the abstract expressionists were like, yes, I'm trying to express deep loneliness and sadness. And Jasper Johns, if you read anything into this work of art, I don't think he would have intended it to. Yeah. And that's kind of the fun of the art world is coming up with your own interpretation. Which, of course, you will be doing as you turn in your papers. <clears throat> I have no clue. Just to make something weird and silly and interesting to look at. That's kind of what art is. Another thing I want to point out, what media was used? Encaustic. Do you remember what encaustic is? <gasps> Anybody remember encaustic? made with melted wax. Right. It's a wax-based paint. And I bring that up because uh, it just so happens this is the only work of art that we've seen that uses encaustic, other than the one I showed you for encaustic. Uh, it's a very unusual, rare type of paint, and I just felt like that was worth uh, pointing out. Maybe worth you guys writing down. Wink. Sorry, I've got something in my eye. That's it. Good. <laughs> All right. So moving on. Pop art. I dig it. So pop art, uh, it's kind of fun uh, what pop art is all about. Pop art is all about uh, sort of like seeing similarities between the art world and the real world, pop culture, if you will. So what are some common subjects in, I'm going to say, high art? The kind of stuff that you'd see in a museum or in an art history book. Common subjects of art. History painting. Mythology. Religion. Stuff from the Bible. Yeah, love stories. Yeah, things that make a political message. Uh, common other subjects include still life, nude studies, and typically art that we see at museums is a one-of-a-kind, unique work of art. One of a kind. There's only one Mona Lisa, and you go to the museum and you admire it, and part of what makes it special is that there is only one, and it was created by the artist. This is none of those things. What's the medium? Mm -hmm. a it's a collage. Yeah, it's a paper collage. These were cut out of magazines. He didn't make it. Well, I mean, he did, but he didn't, you know, draw it or paint it. And the thing about, I'm going to put here, low art, modern society can hold out mass production. Crank it out. And this work of art reflects that. It's a collage. It's not a one of a kind. Well, it has several editions or several periods. Uh, no, this is, uh, well, as in, it's not a one of a kind work of art in that he didn't paint it or draw it. It is one of a kind in that there's only one of these pieces by Richard Hamilton. Just what is it that makes today's home so different, so appealing? I forget which museum has this. Okay, here, let's take a look. Uh, Mr. Dude there, where do you suppose he came from? Muscle Magazine. Yeah, Muscle Magazine, probably some sort of like bodybuilding advertisement. He's sort of the modern equivalent of Michelangelo's David or uh, the spear bearer, the nude athlete in Contrapposto. Only here, in 
modern art, he's a uh, bodybuilder. What about little Missy over there on the couch? Yeah, probably came from a dirty mag, probably came from porn. So she's the female nude. It's basically saying art, used, art has always been about exploring the female nude, but it's no longer Venus. The nudes that we see today are Playboy. Um, Richard Hamilton called these two Adam and Eve. And what else do Adam and Eve have in their different and appealing home? A Tootsie Pop, which will help you on the test whenever I ask you what style is this work of art. Pop. Yeah, it's looking right in the face. They got a what? Size of a hammer. Size of a hammer? Oh, yeah, like, I think it's supposed to be like his, like his dumbbells, yeah. There's a ham, so that's kind of the still life. Today's food is not a beautiful arrangement of apples and bananas and pineapples, it's a canned ham that came from the store. Right, so up there on the wall, it's not a great narrative painting, it's not like the, uh, the girl on the swing, it's a cheap, pulpy, mass-produced romance comic. Uh, the jazz singer, the very first talking motion picture. So basically everything in their house is new and improved. As you can see, they've got a new vacuum. Ordinary cleaners reach only this far, it says. They have a new Wi-Fi. They have, or not Wi-Fi, Hi-Fi. I don't think they have Wi-Fi in 1955. Uh, they've got new couches. They've got a new TV. Everything in their house is very 50s. This is a very 50s home. And it actually makes kind of a good point about mass production. Like, when's the last time you had food or you ate a meal where nothing came from a factory? season it with lemons that I got from a store. I'll season it with salt that I got from a store. Everything is kind of pre-packaged in a way. And the same thing like if you were to make your own clothes. No one sews their own clothes. It all comes from a factory. Their furniture. It's not homemade hand-carved antiques. It's just cheap vinyl sofas. It's also very linear, too. The only work we see is on those mm-hmm. Yeah, very boxy, very modern, very slick and clean. And actually, what is up there on the ceiling? It's the moon. So the idea of like, wow, one day we'll go to the moon. In 1956, that was a very romantic notion. And something that I find really funny about uh, this piece, by the way, this is one of my all-time favorite titles. Just what is it that makes today's home so different, so appealing? What a great title. Uh, he did a follow-up in 1992, called Just What Is It That Makes Today's Home So Different. So what's changed for Adam and Eve in their home? <laughs> yep. Moon, been there, done that. 1992, they're exploring the moon. The male and female roles have switched. Now she's the bodybuilder. She's the one in charge. Yep. So no more canned ham. Now they've got a microwave fish stick. They got a new TV, new sound system. Mm-hmm. New light. Yeah, up there, out there in the uh, out the windows, that's uh, the Gulf War and Ethiopian starvation victims, the sort of uh, big issues that were happening in the nineties. Is that just kind of a motherboard? Yes. Yeah. Good guy. The uh, the walls are like a circuit board. It's it's the nineties. Uh, the sculpture is um, Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister of, um, of Great Britain, and she's uh, sitting on top of a pedestal that says Jeff Koons, a very famous contemporary artist. Huh. And I think it's kind of funny because it makes sense, I think more sense, whenever you see these two next to each other. And I think it would be kind of fun to do a Just What Is It follow-up for 2017. Like, what, what would Adam and Eve's home look like today. Yep, so now Mars is on everyone's mind. Or Pluto, maybe. Everyone's arguing about Pluto. I 
think the food, what sort of food do you think they'd be eating? I think they'd be eating like whole foods, like some sort of goofy, vegan, organic kale monstrosity. Gluten-free. Gluten-free. It'd have to be gluten-free. I wonder what Adam and Eve would be like. Probably looking at their phones. Yeah, probably. They'd be sitting down looking at their phones. It's like pop art is about looking at what's important to your culture. And in a way, art has always done that. They're just doing kind of the, I don't know, I think it's very slick. It's very smart when you look at it. This artist, Andy Warhol, he's the guy who really excelled at pop art, really helped to define its language. Uh, so what's the subject of this work of art? Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe. And it's called Marilyn Diptych. And a diptych, especially whenever it has a gold background like that, is usually something that you see on an altarpiece for like the Virgin Mary. And this kind of comes back to, as you said, one of the common subjects for art is religion, uh, gods and goddesses. But when's the last time we saw a work of art that was biblically themed? It's been a while, yeah. And he's kind of saying, this is our goddess, this is our idol whom we worship, Marilyn Monroe, the screen goddess. And she's a mass-produced image repeated over and over through silk screening. It's been screen printed. And um, he's almost saying that it's like she was made in a factory, like a can of Campbell's soup. Like, uh, okay, let's look at uh, Marilyn. Uh, do you know, was that her real name? No. Mm -mm. Her name was like Norma Jean Baker, I think. Yeah, they, she came to Hollywood, she dyed her hair, they, she kind of donned this silly persona, she was always given the same roles. She wasn't a screen, she was a screen star, not a um, stage star. She was mass produced, lots of movies, lots of roles, lots of copies projected all over the world because we demanded more and more Marilyn. It's like we were wanted her to be mass produced for our consumption. And when was this made? And that's the year that Marilyn Monroe died. Do you all know how Marilyn Monroe died? Overdose. That's right. It's a drug overdose. Some say it might have been a suicide. And, well, you know how it is when a celebrity dies. You can't turn a corner without seeing their image everywhere. And it's just like this pervasive image of Marilyn recently died as kind of a comment on how we have consumed celebrities. Yeah, today we look at her uh, much more sympathetically, but in the 50s and 60s, she was really drowning under the weight of this persona. She was just like, I think last year it was for the Snickers commercial. Oh, gosh. Yeah, it's like, and she still kind of is seen that way. It's just like this silly, pretty, funny, blonde. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like they've run out of the ink. She's right. starting to fade out over there on the right, like a flickering film. Exactly. And whenever you look at the close-up here, you can see that her face looks really strange. Uh, like he didn't really line up the screens well on purpose. Uh, the lipstick and the teeth are kind of off. Some places he pushed too hard on the screen. Some places he pushed too light. Just really calling attention to the fact that this is a mass-produced image, not a hand-painted portrait. And the fact that she looks so fake may also be kind of a comment on, well, who was she? Maybe she wasn't real. really perceptive of you and I think that 
yeah, Andy Warhol was really sensitive to who Marilyn Monroe was. I think kind of put more thought into her life and celebrity more than other people were willing to do in 1960s. Moving on, um, this one I didn't put on the test, uh, but I thought it was kind of interesting that you said history paintings uh, are a common subject. Uh, this is kind of like the 1960s equivalent of a great war painting, like Goya's Third of May, but in our society, it's this graphic violence that's spread all over the media. So, like, violence in the media that we get inured to because we see it so much. That's kind of like modern pop art uh, history painting. Yeah. Uh, what about Drowning Girl? Where did Roy Lichtenstein get this image from? Oh, yeah, a comic book. So, this is kind of like the low art equivalent of a, uh, like a portrait, Mona Lisa, beautiful woman's face, common subject for high art, and this is the 1960s high art. Little girl here. I'd rather sink and call Brad for help. Like Veronica from Archie. Kind of does. Uh, came from a similar comic, too, that as Archie, just this pulpy, cheap, silly romance comic. How big is this image, though? real big and whenever you get like a tiny little comic book image and blow it up you're really aware of how strange it looks. Uh, Roy Lichtenstein would uh, even replicate the cheap dots that you would see in cheap printing presses and now his styles become kind of iconic but in a way it's almost like he didn't even come up with it um, and now there's actually a big push for people to try and find the, uh, the original images, the comic books that he used for inspiration, and this is actually the source for Drowning Girl. Uh, what's he changed? Yeah, kind of cleaned up the lines of her face and her hands. The names have been changed. The names, from Mal to Brad. A whole section on this is about five, seven Yeah, changed the words. Yeah, the waves have become more cartoony, uh, kind of more clean, and like her hair, the color of her hair is really pumped up. Right, cramped out, uh, co cut out a good part of the uh, comic book panel. <laughs> oh, that's true, yeah, added some shading to her lips. Yeah, almost made her look more fakey. Uh, I also like to put the citation up there um, because if any of you guys ever go to a comic book store, there's lots of comics collectors always looking for, you know, like a rare Spider-Man or Superman. This is not a great comic. This is a cheap, stupid, pulpy comic. It's worth, like, nothing. If you go to a vintage comic store, you could probably get a whole stack of love comics for a quarter. But if you have the patience, Dig around. See if you can find Secret Hearts number 83, published by DC Comics. If you find it, get it and put it on eBay because some art collector will pay a couple hundred bucks for it uh, because now people who collect Lichtenstein also are now trying to collect the comics. Mm -hmm. So Secret Hearts number 83, uh, it actually is especially valuable because it provided the basis for two Lichtensteins, Drowning Girl and Hopeless. So people who own these prints are all looking for the original comics. It's kind of funny to think that a cheap, pulpy comic. Run for Love. Run for Love. Uh, it's well, it's a story. Like, there's a bunch of stories in it. Uh, but the name of the comic is Secret Hearts. So it's Secret Hearts number 83, 1962 from DC Comics. No, no. I uh, read synopsis of it because now it's kind of the subject of scrutiny because it's such a big collector's item because it's a Lincoln scene image. Yeah, I don't know. It looks very tragic and pathetic. <laughs> He's writing the, uh, they're both flipped over. <laughs> Let's see. Yep. All right, so let's move over to chapter 24.
for part two. <clears throat> Yay. All right, so over here I had, um, uh, I was marking off the what is art, the idea that art should tell a story, be self-expressive. Art is typically a painting, a sculpture, a drawing, a one-of-a-kind object that one sees in a gallery or museum. Every single one of these things is going to be knocked off the board by one of these artists. Starting with conceptual art. You're going to love this. What is this work of art by Joseph Kosu? One and three chairs. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know my addition is so pretty good, but I was confused. Where the heck is the third? Uh, well, one chair is the chair. Two, the picture of a chair. And then what do we have on the right? The dictionary definition of chair. So what is the message of this work of art? Different. What is chair? <laughs> What does it mean to be chair? What if there's a perfect chair out there and every chair that exists is only a simulacra of chair? How can we experience the fullness of chairness? It's not an object, though. It's just a concept. Conceptual art is something that gets you thinking, and it's not so much about the object that you're looking at. So there are lots of times in art history where a work of art is not that exciting to look at, and then I tell you the story behind it, and suddenly it becomes interesting. The concept is more important than the art. Well, here there is no art. If you were to write your, uh, your essay on conceptual art, your description would be blank, and your interpretation would be three pages long. Take 15 minutes to say the word south work of conceptual art. Isn't that a great work of art? That is great. Yep. Yoko Ono came up with that. She was a conceptual artist. That's like uh, one of my favorites where I did, I went over to Armstrong and I did something on a piece like a, it was like a robot and a bird. Mm -hmm. and a bird uh, and like the head and stuff like that. But I didn't know what it was. So maybe the object isn't important, but the thought behind it. Uh, but Joseph Kosuth took it a step further by not making any art. It's only concept. Yeah. It's 60s. Strap in. On the opposite end of the spectrum is minimalism. And with them, it's your description would take forever, but your analysis, your interpretation, what does it mean, would be blank. Minimalism is driven by the question, is it possible to have a work of art that has no subject, no self-expression, no story, no meaning? Can it still be an interesting work of art? So what do you think? Do you find this interesting? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. What's the title of this? Untitled. Untitled, yeah. If this was called bookshelf, or if this was called um, Jacob's Ladder or Stairway to Heaven, then we would interpret it. But he doesn't want you to. He doesn't want to infer anything. It's just what you see is what you got. Very minimal, very stripped down. What do you think of Ellsworth Kelly? Come on. I got a military member that looks like that. Blue, green, yellow, orange, red. How big is it? Five feet tall by 20 feet wide. This is a huge work of art. And in that respect, it's very similar to Mark Rothko and color field painting. But how is it different from Mark Rothko? You're kind of shaking your heads on it. You put effort into it. Mm -hmm. That one just said, oh, blue, green, yellow. Yes. Yeah. Whatever that other color is, golden. Yeah, the two extra colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rothko, he blended the colors. It's more painterly. You can see his hand in it. It's expressive. Ellsworth Kelly is just, just simple, clean lines. And honestly, it is kind of hard to paint an oil painting that big and not 
have any brush strokes or expressive lines, but it's true. It has no meaning. Mark Rothko was trying to express himself. Minimalist, do not. Minimalism is clean, simple. Do you like it? Yeah, these are all some famous works of minimalism. I think you remember. Yeah, Tilt the Dark. The rope piece? It's interesting. And it's like, he's not trying to say anything. It's just a rope. It's just supposed to be visually interesting to look at. I like the two body or And it's interesting because uh, I'm, I'm glad that you guys actually are responding positively to minimalism because sometimes people are like, oh, brother, you call that art? It's just a big old cube. It's true. Yeah, people are always critical. Um, yeah, and I think that some of us are more receptive towards minimalism because uh, it's still very much a part of our modern lives. Minimalist design, minimalist uh, product design, like Apple, is very much driven by the minimalist movement. Not a lot of fuss, very clean, simple lines, very elegant and understated. That's minimalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's something kind of nice about yeah these minimalist interiors. Nice and clean. And a minimalist wedding dress. It's not all covered with lace and flowers and zippers and bows. It's just simple and yeah. Or the Beatles White Album, classic minimalist album cover. Yeah, great album. <laughs> All right. These two kind of combine the concept of, well, conceptual art and the visual nature of minimalism, but very different from minimalists. Um, okay, so this is Christo and Jean Claude. Uh, they are husband and wife artists. Not their real names, that's kind of like artist monikers. And they collaborate on site-specific projects. So what they're eliminating over here is the idea that art uh, must be on display inside a venue. You don't have to go to a museum to see a Christo and Jean Claude. You have to go outside. Now, uh, what are the dimensions of this piece? 24 and a half miles. What's it? Yeah, and the thing is, like, if you were trying to ask Christian and Jean Claude, oh, what are you trying to say? Are you making a comment about the Wall of China? Is this about immigration? Is this about unification? It's like, no, it's just it's whatever you want to read into it. They just like to make these beautiful things. But what are some maybe some questions that you have just about the logistics of running fence. How did you get all that fabric? How did you get permission to do this? How did you, how long did it take you? How much money did this cost? How much money am I paying for it? Yeah, the upkeep. Well, actually, there's very little upkeep because uh, another thing about Christo and Jean-Claude is their projects are only up for a short period. This was up for two weeks and then dismantled. Just like all these other projects. Yeah. It's a lot of work for just two weeks of running fence. So what? People came to Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anytime. Then it's gone. They just put it up like the gates. It was up for 15 days. People came from all over the world to walk through Central Park, and then it was gone. Yeah. And uh, all the permission that they have to get to wrap the Reichstag up in fabric, to put up surrounded islands around Miami, this takes a lot of trouble. Wait, what is that? Uh, this is floating synthetic fabric around 11 islands in Miami. Uh, the Reichstag is like the uh, the German version of the FBI. Like, what is they, what is the it is one million square feet of fabric or so, oh. and about 20 miles of rope. Just the whole thing is wrapped up in fabric like a Christmas present. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
It looks like something you'd see in a movie, but they actually really did that. I remember that one now. The umbrella? Yeah, the yellow one. Get out of here. Yeah, they opened them uh, as the sun rose across the countries. Yeah. That's it. It's like, what does this mean? What's the point? Well, there isn't one. Crystal and Jean-Claude, can I have one of these? No. Nope. Their art is not a commodity. Not for sale. No one can buy it. They also accept no admission fees it's for everybody. They accept no government grants. So what oh, taxpayer dollars used to clean up? No, no taxpayer dollars, no volunteers even, no sponsorships. It's all self-funded, self-put together. They uh, go through all the process, pay all their workers, and that's that. That's, yeah, and that's the thing. So are these guys crazy billionaires? Not quite. Uh, the way that they fund their projects is by making and selling small works like these. Uh, although this was actually a gift to Charles Schultz, uh, and thanks for this kind of silly co uh, comic book that he put together. But yeah, all of his work are paid a fair wage, and uh, this is the way that they make money, by selling prints. So whenever they have a concept in mind, they'll put together photographs, prints, plans, and they'll sell those. And that's how they fund these projects. So the floating piers, this is their most recent one. Connecting these islands in. Isn't that amazing? And it's just, it was up for like 10 days and now it's gone. I know. And you know, people are all, uh, I think it's kind of interesting how he can kind of shut down any complaints that you might throw at him. He's a, very clever, very inspirational artist. That's not him, is it? That is him. That's him on the upper right. Uh, he's like a weird uh, Doc Brown art elf. I love him. He's adorable. Um, and unfortunately, Jean Claude has passed away. She died in 2009. Uh, Christo's pushing 90, but he's still still working, uh, still trying to realize the last of their projects that they had come up with when they were married. Uh, so this is uh, has been Christo's most recent like installation project, and right now he basically has two more on his plate. Uh, one is the Mastaba, which he's working on now. Uh, I'm not sure how far he's gotten, or if it'll actually come to be, uh, considering the location. But if he gets away with this, it'll be the only permanent installation of his, and it will also be the largest work of art ever created in the world. Yeah, good luck to him for that. And the other project on his plate was something called Over the River, which was going to be uh, sections of fabric suspended at intervals over like 20 miles of the Arkansas River in Colorado, which he recently canceled. Ugh. I'm so bummed whenever I read this. I've been following this project for years. And just this year, he announced that he's not going to pursue it. And I'm bummed. Um, he doesn't want to work with the present um, uh, governmental administration. Yeah. Uh, and he's going to do this big project. Yeah. And he had already, well, uh, he was already well into development. I don't think he started on the fabric. Uh, but he got the permits to do it. And then some citizens sued him, or no, sued the uh, the state for giving them the permits. So he was in process in court of trying to get those lawsuits dismissed. And he had just gotten rid of the last lawsuit and was going to move forward to have this project installed. And now he said that he doesn't want to work with the current president because this is, in a sense, his land and he doesn't want to work with them. So, yeah, I'm, kind of, I'm really bummed about that. But he, uh, he answered town hall meetings for all of these concerned citizens throwing roadblocks in his way, uh, assaging their fears that the hold fast are secure, the, the fabric will not harm wildlife. And he even was going to pay for paramedics. There was concern that this road here might get clogged up um, with all the people looking at the yards and that an ambulance couldn't get through. And he was going to pay for two paramedic um 
uh, helicopter crews to be on 24-7 standby the entire duration of Over the River. Isn't that amazing? Good He's got money's no object for Christo. He's a famous world artist, and he also gets uh, lecture fees. So he, he makes a living. I'm hoping. I'm hoping that maybe he'll uh, enough people will be like, please, Christo, please. But uh, especially since he doesn't really seem to be daunted by lawsuits and getting permission. I mean, if he could wrap the entire Reichstag in fabric, surely he can get six miles of fabric. He can do it. Come on. Come on. I'll do it. I'll help. Tell me how. But yeah, that's Christo Jean-Claude. Oh, and the video will not work, so I'll just move on to a similar artist. All right. What's a uh, earthwork? So art made of earth, rocks, natural material. Uh, Robert Smithson is kind of similar to Christo Jean Claude in that uh, he doesn't believe that art should be a commodity. Art should be open for everyone. Uh, the difference is that uh, he works with the earth, doesn't you know create things on the earth. Uh, this is his magnum opus, the spiral jetty. It's about a quarter mile of rocks and a path that stretches out in the middle of the Great Salt Lake. Um, it's pretty cool. He wanted something that almost looked like it could be naturally occurring, but obviously is a man-made work of art. Mm -hmm. uh, hands. This is all handmade. Yeah, uh, it was all rocks and dirt from on site. So it basically just kind of stretched a peninsula out into the Salt Lake. A lot of work, a lot of time. Uh, but he didn't take into consideration the fact that the Salt Lake water levels shift. And a few years after he made it, the water levels rose and it's gone. Uh, at least that's how all the history books say. And if your history book says, oh, it sank out of sight and it's no longer there, it means you need a new history book because about 10 years ago, it came back. And this was big news in the art community. Spiral Jetty's back. Spiral Jetty's back. Uh, spending three decades underwater had crystallized it. The whole thing was covered in white salt crystals. Isn't that amazing? So if you go online, and I would show you now, except the internet's down, uh, there's a bunch of videos of people heading out to Utah. I mean, it's really remote, way out in Nowheresville. And just being, it's like an alien crop circle, this strange thing, just out in the middle of nowhere for anyone to see. Yeah. <laughs> Some people are like, oh, yes, Robert Smithson took this into account. So honestly, Earth artists do have to consider this. Like sometimes earth artists will make sculptures out of icicles and they just naturally melt and just that's part of the natural process of the art. But uh, I think he would wanted it to be <laughs> there. Um, All that work you put into it. On that note, that reminds me of like stuff I saw on, you know, videos and things and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, on earth, art, um, okay. Feminist art. All right, now first let me say feminist art does not mean art made by females. Uh, it means art that deals with feminist issues. Uh, so what are we looking at here? Before I tell you the concept behind this piece, what do you see at the dinner party? Yeah, it's a triangular table. Hmm? Right, plates, forks, um, a table runner, silverware all set up for honored guests. The concept behind the dinner party is women in history who just deserve to be recognized and it's like they're invited to attend this great party. Now, uh, her original concept was to have a long table with 13 place settings, each one with like a little placard for that woman. Uh, but you couldn't come up with just 13. So she expanded it threefold to make the triangular table. But even then was too hard. 
So she came up with 999 additional women to be honored at the dinner party, and their names are on the triangular tile floor. So, nap time! How many women are honored at the dinner party? Thirteen times three is thirty-nine plus nine hundred ninety-nine. <laughs> one thirty-eight. So just take one out of there and add it to that. One thousand thirty-eight women are honored at the dinner party. And once again, if the website was working, I could show you uh, some of them. Um, here's a few that I thought were relevant to an art history lecture. Remember that middle person? Hatshepsut, yeah. The, uh, the Egyptian pharaoh, she's honored at the dinner party. There's one for Susan B. Anthony. Uh, there's one for, uh, I think there's one for Sacagawea. There's one for Sishurner Truth, for the artist. Oh, uh, on the floor. Oh, yes, yes, so on the floor are, are all the names written down. So those are the 999 additional names who didn't get a plate setting. Huh. So each one has a unique plate designed after that woman. Um, and they are, um, well, I wish I could show you some more of them, but I don't know if you get the concept of what they're supposed to look like. Um, female imagery, core imagery, vaginal imagery, if I could say that, <laughs> which is, makes it sometimes a little bit awkward to look at. But it actually is a really big effort. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of information on these people in 1979. Women in history wasn't really a subject someone studied in college. And to put together, I mean, I don't think I could even think of 1,038 historical figures. But she put all this together, and it's a really landmark achievement for like women in history, feminist art. Yeah, Amelia Earhart's up there. I don't think she has a place in it, though. Yeah, Harriet Tubman is honored. I think Rosa Parks is honored. So a lot of, like, civil rights and um, suffragette movement. Uh, her name is Judy Chicago. Um, she is American. It's interesting. Judy Chicago is not her real name. As an artist, she said she wanted to have her own identity, not one that was defined by her father or husband's name, but her own name. Uh, I'm not sure where she's living now. I think she's still alive, though. Yeah, most of these artists are still kicking. All the ones in Chapter 25 are. Yeah, it's, it's almost kind of like traditional female art, you know, painting china, sewing, and quilting, but here put together in something that like honors women instead of just you know, counting on them to do all the work. Uh, but I would recommend uh, heading over to their website. It's at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, and you can look more at each one of these place settings that uh, read up on the women who are honored here. It's a really absorbing art installation. Oh, cool. It's at the Brook. Well, the piece has been purchased by the Brooklyn Museum of Art, and they've put together a whole educational uh, area about women in history. Yeah. Worth checking out. All right. Uh, I'm going to skip this artist here because she's weird. All right. Last artist, and I'm, a, and I'm sorry that I have to leave this as the last artist we talk about in class, that I won't be able to go through chapter 25 in class, but oh well, because Joseph Bowie's is probably my least favorite artist. Did I tell you about this thing yet? Okay, I like America, and America likes me. Again, there is a video of the performance online, but... Ah. Alright, so Joseph Bowie's. He, um... He uh, comes from Germany, and he came to the United States and had himself wrapped in a blanket and carried onto an ambulance. And they drove him through New York City to an art gallery where they unloaded him and put him in a cage with, what do we have here? A 
coyote. A live, wild American coyote. And for seven days, he and the coyote lived in this cage, and that was the art. Uh, he would wrap himself in this blanket, poke him with a shepherd's crook. Um, there were stacks of Wall Street journals delivered to them. And at the end of seven days, he was carried out, put back in an ambulance, taken back to the uh, airport, and went back to Germany. And the name of the art is, I Like America and America Likes Me. So, what do you think he's trying to say? <laughs> the best summary I heard of this art installation was, it makes as much sense to me as it did to the coyote. But this is the 70s, and this is a great example of something called performance art. And it kind of comes back to conceptual art, because nothing is made. Uh, there is no object to look at. It's just an idea, or in this case, just an action perform, and that's the art. Very progressive, very 70s, very, I think, in poor taste. I don't like Joseph Bowie's. I think he is a nut. I also know why he covered his head in honey, slapped gold leaf onto it, and went into an art gallery with a dead bunny and started talking to it about the art on display. No one could stop you in the 60s. You could do anything you want, and people would call it art. And this is why I think a lot of people are generally very impatient with contemporary art and think that all you have to do to be an artist is to, I don't know, squeeze a tube of paint up your nose and sneeze onto a canvas. But honestly, that doesn't fly anymore. Joseph Bowie's, I don't think, would succeed in today's competitive Internet-based art world, where you really do have to be much more impressive <laughs> and less conceptual. But if you want to hear about those artists, you'll have to check out the other video that I made. So I shall bid my uh, class here farewell. Thank you for listening. And...